Hello, and welcome to Ask an Archaeologist. I'm Nico Tripsevich, and I'm the host of today's show. Ask an Archaeologist is a series of live streamed interviews co-hosted by the Archaeological Research Facility and the Phoebe A. Hearst Museum of Anthropology for, uh, for Cal Week 2020. Each day at 11 and 2, we will interview UC Berkeley archaeologists and answer audience questions. If you go, if you have a question to ask, go to Slido, sli.do, and, and type in ask ARF, and uh, one word, and click on join, and you can type in your question. And I'll remind you of this partway through the interview. So today's speaker uh, is Scott Byram, um, and he's going to be presenting. Dr. Scott Byram is a research affiliate with the Archaeological Research Facility, and he's conducted ground penetrating radar, or GPR, on Cal projects on four continents. Most of his work is in California and in Oregon. Scott uses GPR to survey sites ranging from shell mounds to adobe ruins and from historic homesteads, cemeteries, fortif fortifications, and wreckage sites. Scott will be presenting his talk, How Artifacts and Ruins Before They Begin an Excavation. So welcome, Scott. Um, so my first question is, how do archaeologists use ground penetrating radar to map these things? Well, um, I uh, will be able to demonstrate a little more clearly with some imagery. But basically, we're using electromagnetic waves uh, to uh, send radar into the ground and then uh, receive a reflection back from uh, the energy that comes back from the objects below the surface and, and that um, the, the pattern in those waves, the magnitude and the, the time of travel is what we use to actually map archaeological features below the surface. Mm -hmm. um, if you have slides you want to share with us, you're welcome to, to bring those up. Okay. Um, All right, uh, let me uh, pull up a presentation here. Are you able to see my screen yet? Not yet. Okay, let me share this. All, All right. right, let's see. Let's put full size there. Okay, uh, so, yeah, we can, uh, we can talk about the different techniques that we use uh, when we're using ground penetrating radar and how we, how we uh, identify different types of archaeological features. Here I'm mapping a, a cemetery actually at uh, Black Diamond Mines in uh, uh, the East Bay. Um, and you can see a GPR profile and a GPR slice map. And we'll look at a few more of those. But uh, just to put it in perspective, uh, GPR is different from other techniques that archaeologists use to scan the landscape and identify um, archaeological features and characterize entire archaeological sites and landscapes. Um, uh, one that's fairly, fairly common uh, these days that's very effective is LIDAR. And that's often done, uh, that can be done on the ground with an instrument on a tripod, which ARF uses, but um, more often it's used from an airplane and can be used, it uses uh, 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 laser technology and light information to uh, characterize topography and features, for example, uh, Mayan cities and channels uh, for agriculture that are present under a forest canopy in the Yucatan Peninsula can be characterized with uh, LIDAR. Uh, magnetometry, seen here, held by Nico Tripsevich and uh, his daughter, Sophie, and, and my son, Diego. Uh, this is a very effective technique. The gradiometer or magnet magnetometer is, is great for studying uh, subsurface magnetics. And this technique is useful for identifying, especially uh, metal artifacts, but also burned features and bricks and ceramics and things that anything that's got a aligned uh, magnetism to it. Um, but it's a passive technique. It doesn't send a radar wave or it doesn't send any information into the ground. It actually just receives whatever magnetic information is coming in. 
And then sonar, you can see here on the bottom right, is what's used in saltwater. Ground penetrating radar doesn't work in saltwater because the salt crystals attenuate the radar signal. They keep the radar from reflecting back towards the antenna. So uh, with that being ineffective, we're able to use sonar instead to identify buried sh uh, shipwrecks that might be on the, on the sea floor, for example. Um, and so that's a, a very effective technique in saltwater. GPR can be used in freshwater, although it's rarely done so um, because there's, salt is not an issue in freshwater. But uh, ground penetrating radar is the technique that we often use on land. And it it's, provides the greatest detail of any of the techniques for remote sensing below the surface. Um, and especially uh, it's valuable in that it, it allows us to look at the depth of different things that we're identifying in contrast with magnetometry, which is two dimensional. It'll only show uh, the magnitude of the magnetic information at a particular location on the site. GPR will show uh, features, but also their depth. So we can look at them in both profile and in plan with slice maps that we make. Mm -hmm. And here's some GPR in action. Um, this is Professor Jun Sinceri uh, from Cal, who's pulling the, the 900 megahertz antenna right here with a wheel behind it for measuring distance that goes along the top of the screen as the data is being scrolled across. So there are varied features showing up in an individual transect profile. You can see we're working on a grid that we've marked out with chalk in this parking lot at Santa Clara Adobe's. And there I am using a three wheel cart with a 400 megahertz slightly larger antenna. And as the antenna moves across the ground surface, you can see uh, the buried object, object below becomes more and more visible. And these are different objects right here that are similar to what you see in this diagram over here. So the antenna is moving across up here. And then this is the depth scale on the other side in the, in the, in the screen. So that's what we look at as we're doing the GPR. Then as we process it, we get more information. We take that same transect profile and then we can look at multiple transects in a grid and create three-dimensional imagery, basically like a whole bunch of Lego blocks the entire grid would be made of. And each Lego block has its own amplitude value. And that allows us to create amplitude slice maps at various depths. And here's a Native American clay house floor feature in California. Um, shows up in profile as this sort of darker um, black and white lines. And then uh, with the color scale that we're using, red is high amplitude and yellow is relatively high. And that's the floor of the, of, of the house that's buried about 60 centimeters down at this site. And out in this area, there aren't any features. And here's a feature closer to the ARF um, here at Cal at the faculty club. Um, some what we believe are foundations of cottages that were there before the faculty club was built when this was not actually part of campus, but a place where people lived off campus in the very early 1900s. Mm -hmm. And this is what it looks like in profile. And this is where that transect profile crosses the grid, this red line. And so it intersects the feature at various locations, these different foundations and it's putting together multiple transects profiles that allow us to generate these maps of, of features below the surface. Are you generally walking in straight lines when you use this instrument? Very important to walk in straight lines and keep them evenly spaced because we're gonna borrow data from adjacent transects. So we need to be able to, um, if, if, we, if we wobble too much, we're gonna get um, we're going to create our own artifacts. We're basically going to see some, some errors in the data if we do that. Mm -hmm. the, the antenna also has to maintain constant contact with the ground surface. I can't pick it up and go over something and, and resume unless I make a note of it in my, in my uh, observations notebook that the, uh, uh, that part of the transect uh, will have to be ignored because it, it won't actually show what's below the surface. Mm -hmm. So are these different depths? 
Yeah, so this is a that set of looking at here? different depths. And uh, this is a project the uh, Vallejo's Petaluma Adobe. And I know you're familiar with this one, having done the magnetometry work out there. Mm -hmm. um, but the, uh, this is over in Petaluma. And uh, it was a massive, it's one of the largest standing historical adobe structures in North America, I believe. Um, but in the past, there was a southern part of the adobe. And so our work with, between Cal and Sonoma State and California State Parks was to um, characterize the, uh, the foundation of the adobe, that's no, the portion that's no longer there. Um, and there was one question as to whether or not there was a roof over the adobe, and I can come back to that a little bit later because we've got some information about that based on our GPR survey. But just to show you how it works, um, those slice maps that are made up of individual transects uh, processed together in, in the software that we use, they, they show us uh, what things look like below the surface at different depths. But again, we're looking at the magnitude of reflections, high, high amplitude or low amplitude reflections of materials that are down below and different materials, whether it's an adobe brick or a stone or just the, the, the native soil surrounding have different magnitudes in their reflection based on how, how quickly they conduct electromagnetic waves. But mm -hmm. as we go down in depth, 25 centimeters, to 45 centimeters, you can be, begin to see a rectangular feature. This is 20 meters, so this is 20 yards across, 60, five feet across right here. So it's a pretty big area. As you can see in this Google Earth aerial image, and those are cars parked down there for scale. Um, uh, you can see this is a pretty big uh, grid. This is a little bit larger coverage than the grids that are in this slice map. This is just partial, but as we get down to 55 centimeters, we've got a very distinct rectilinear feature here. And what we have are the external walls of the adobe and then some internal walls Mm -hmm. for the room blocks, and then probably some features that were inside the courtyard and inside the structure itself. Mm -hmm. So this was the planned addition that never got built. So we can expect it to have had the similar shape to, it was the other half, right? It sure uh, seems to different. have sort of a, a reflection. It would have been a square when it was done, I suppose. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we don't know if it ever had, I mean, we know that the foundation was there and that some walls were built, but we don't know if it ever had a roof. And that's one of the questions I'll come back to in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, let me just take a moment to remind everyone that if you'd like to ask us questions, if you'd like to send Scott a question here about ground penetrating radar, you can go to, uh, to the website Slido, Slido, S L I dot D O, and put in ask ARF, A S K A R F. And then you can put a, put a question to Scott either anonymously or you can put your name in. And, uh, and we'll share it with him. Thanks, go on, Scott. So uh, Cal projects have, several Cal projects have taken place at uh, California Mission Adobes or Adobe era villages. Um, in particular, we've been interested in looking at the, uh, 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 the structures that are no longer present on the surface. Um, some of the historical adobes like Sanchez Adobe are still standing. Um, in other cases, there were Native American villages that were adjacent that were made from smaller adobe walls. Um, and we're very interested in, in the history of those places, especially. Um, so uh, we've, we've really uh, uh, expanded the methodology for understanding uh, adobe structures with uh, remote sensing. In, in a lot of cases, uh, archaeologists have had difficulty identifying them, but in, uh, we're, our techniques are showing uh, pretty clearly the foundations of adobes at several sites. In some cases, we're looking at the sandstone blocks themselves, the mm -hmm. San Juan Batista. And even in 1856, it was a ruin that was collapsing. There wasn't much left of this from the uh, this uh, native family housing that was built in the uh, 18, in around 1820, I believe. Mm -hmm. Our affiliate, Glenn Ferris, uh, took the lead on this project. And we, we did the GPR there um, in 20, I believe. And here's where the transect crosses the adobe wall. And outside of the wall, we believe, are a series of the posts that were um, put in to um, support the roof because the roof has to extend beyond the adobes. And when we, this is what the site looks like today. There's, there's no evidence of the adobe on the surface, but you can see it in the, in the, uh, the GPR data. Mm -hmm. And if we go back to the Sanchez adobe, you can see those posts. Um, 
and the extending uh, roof that overhangs. And to go back to the Vallejo Adobe, that was one of the questions they had for us in, in starting this project was if there was any evidence of the, uh, of the roof having extended beyond the wall. And we don't see those in the wow. grid at uh, Vallejo Adobe. So right. we should conclude well, we, that they probably didn't ever complete that, that part of the building. Mm. Um, and then just a couple of other examples of uh, places where we've done work on adobes. I wanted this to ask on that previous slide. It looks like you have a, you, it looks like you have a historic map lined up. Are you able to use these these historic maps to help locate old walls? Often we do. Yeah, we have some information. Um, but again, with the Mission Adobes, uh, we have the best information about the more, most well-known structures, and we don't, don't typically know that much about, for example, the Native American villages uh, that were adjacent to the Mission compounds. Um, so sometimes we're going with, with known maps. In this case, these were uh, commissioned by the Mission itself to be built, so we do have some records. Uh, but Glenn was able to draw up this diagram based on his archival research and then uh, a, an archaeological test trench and some probing with the rod that determined where some of the stones were. And we, we confirmed its uh, characteristics with the GPR and then we were able to locate the, the identify the posts outside mm -hmm. the structure as well. Mm -hmm. We have a, a viewer question here. They want to know if you can find burials or skeletons with this technology. Uh, it's, it really depends on the situation. Um, I would say in, in many cases, historical cemeteries from the last couple of hundred years, uh, we're able to see where the graves are located, especially the grave pits. Um, if the coffin was very substantial, and certainly if there's any metal involved in, in its construction, um, we'll, we'll be able to see that typically. Um, often we just see the pit itself and we don't see the contents too clearly, especially if it's a, uh, it would just be bones and, and deteriorated clothing and, and the pine box or something. But uh, so bones don't typically show up very well, um, but the pit itself does. And if there's an excavation that needs to happen at that location, um, the archeologist typically follows with the, the probing to determine what's in the pit. Mm -hmm. after I've determined where the pit is with the GPR. So we oh, can it looks, confirm that. It looks like you're showing us a, a profile showing a void. So this is perhaps what these pits look yeah. like? Yeah, actually, if there were a coffin with the, with the um, intact um, top, then it would look a little bit like this does right here with mm -hmm. the void underneath. This is a void um, at, a, at a cavern location just to show how we can locate tunnels and culverts. Mm. So this would have had a reinforced roof on it, which may provide yeah. more reflection as well, right? Yeah, you can see the stonework that's uh, in an archway here. Um, mm -hmm. That's pretty typical in, in some of these older catacomb type features. Mm -hmm. Another setting where we've done several CAL projects. Uh, Dr. Kent Lightfoot has led uh, extensive research at Fort Ross, and um, we've done several GPR projects since uh, 2012 out there. Mm -hmm. This is probably the remains of the flagpole pit in the center of the stockade that we identified as one example. That's an, another GPR profile. Oh, yeah, uh, Professor Lightfoot will be speaking with us later this week, I think. Wonderful. Thursday or Friday. Yeah. What did you find there? You were looking for a flagpole, you said? Uh, yeah, actually, um, Glenn Ferris, who's uh, formerly the uh, head archaeologist for California State Parks and now an ARF, ARF affiliate, um, was interested in uh, locating the, the historic flagpole location from, that would have been put in around 1817. And he, based on sketches and um, his assessment of the archival materials, he thought it was within this area. He, he made a small grid about four by four meters. Um, and so within the center of the stockade, it actually wasn't exactly in the center, it was offset a bit, but so we ran a, a series of transects within that small grid and, and uh, we found a pit 
just about where you'd put his wooden stake where he estimated it to be. Um, there hasn't been any subsequent excavation, but I think eventually there's a plan to, to test that and see if that's actually what it is. Um, in other cases, we've looked at the Russian uh, cemetery from uh, where the officers and, and uh, traders were buried and, and uh, identified graves that weren't previously known about um, for preservation. That's just for, for monumenting purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, our next project involves looking at the, uh, the village that was outside the stockade where uh, Russians were intermarried with uh, Pomo native women and there was a, a village there outside uh, to the uh, west or northwest of the stockade. Unfortunately, for, from my perspective, uh, there was a ranch that was built on top of it, the Call Ranch. So I'll have to be differentiating ranching era features from the village, uh, but that's also what the archeologists on the project, the other archeologists will be focusing on through their mm -hmm. excavation. They are able to do those. Mm -hmm. So is GPR, inter is there interference from other, other things in the area like, um, you know, I know that magnetometry, you have to be very careful about the presence of ferrous objects, old plows, nails. Seems like GPR is more tolerant of, of noise. Yeah, it does pretty well uh, around metal. Um, let's see, if I'm going up against uh, uh, the metal, uh, uh, metal chain link fence or uh, sheet metal, if, if that's nearby, I can get some reflections off of that. Um, but I could generally still get good data. The only problem is if I'm having to go over metal, I won't be able to get much radar data through it. Mm -hmm. um, and actually within Fort Ross, State Parks has put down a, a, a mesh grid to protect or to keep their paths from being dug up by rodents, by, by gophers, for example. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't get any data when I go over those pathways. Um, mm -hmm. Elsewhere, I can go over concrete or asphalt and get really good data through that. Mm -hmm. Um, as long as there's not too much rebar in the concrete. Um, but uh, yeah, metal mesh and sheet metal, uh, things like that really uh, just prevent me from seeing just straight through it. But I'm not um, usually affected by a nearby metal. I see. And I know if you, you've used this in uh, beach settings to find things buried in the sand. Are there issues with being near the, the ocean? There are. Um, you can get uh, quite a bit of information from the upper portion from, of the beach. Sand is actually an ideal situation for uh, doing GPR. But once you get into an area where there's saltwater intrusion, which is going to happen before you start to see the moisture on the surface or where the waves are hitting, um, then the salt uh, keeps the, the radar from being informative because the salt crystals are basically sending the uh, the radar energy away from the instrument, not reflecting it back. Mm -hmm. so we call that attenuation. Well, let me take a moment to remind everyone that um, if you want to send us questions, you can go to sli.do and type in ask ARF and you can write questions to Scott. We have about five or six more minutes. So um, there's still time to field some questions. We have one that just came in from Slido. Um, they want to know, similar to what I was just asking, are there side effects or downsides or limitations to this technology? I know that uh, you need to contact the ground really well, right? So maybe vegetation is an issue. Yeah, those are the sorts of limitations. Um, you, you want a relatively smooth ground surface. Uh, this site that we're looking at here, uh, the curb is a little bit of an issue um, as far as running transects across it. And, and then of course this, this eroding path, it's a, it's a recreation area on the coast, but there's a shell mound layer and you can see how well the layers uh, show up down mm -hmm. below. Uh, getting across the curb becomes a, a little bit of a, um, it's, it's gonna, if I go up and over a curb, then it's gonna show, the radar data is gonna show an artificial pit because mm -hmm. I'm basically going up and away from what's below and then coming back down to it. So, mm -hmm. um, a nice smooth surface, you're not always going to get that at every archaeological site, um, especially an area big enough to do a grid. So we're often confined in where we can put up grids based or set up our grids based on that. Um, mm -hmm. But there aren't any side effects in terms of like you know, people sometimes ask about radiation. It's, it's radar energy. It's not uh, 
it's electromagnetic energy, so it's radio waves, basically. Um, mm -hmm. It's basically like cell phone energy, for example. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, so I assume you, you have to go around objects like you know, poison oak bushes, oh, yeah. trees, and, uh, and so you'll, you'll have a divergence from your grid and then you have to kind of deal with that in the interpretation mm -hmm. stage. Yeah, and when we, if we can use, um, in situations where we can use uh, high precision uh, GPS, RTK GPS in real mm -hmm. time, then the data um, can, uh, we can have a gap in the middle of the grid and it's not a big deal, but for the processing, it's best to have the, the entire rectangle filled with mm -hmm. JSON transects. So I, I definitely spend in, a certain amount of time. In order to make that, that cut, that slice cut, mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, this is where uh, my teenage sons are helpful for uh, 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 doing some clearance, brush clearance before we're actually out mm -hmm. there uh, uh -huh. gathering data. You know, we're often out there with our gardening tools, uh, smoothing things off uh, just to mm -hmm. make it just the right. So we get the best data uh, mm -hmm. at a time. And how did you get how did you get into this technology? Was it difficult to, to get the background and learn it? Or do you need to know a lot about geology or soils to, to you know, properly use this instrument? Yeah, I think it was really helpful that uh, coming into this, I started doing GPR, um, uh, well, 2005 was my first project, but I had, uh, didn't really do it in earnest until uh, as my main uh, focus within archeology span until, about 10 years ago. Um, but uh, prior to that, I'd had extensive experience on excavations and I was really familiar with excavating sites in a lot of different environments in California and Oregon. And that's really helpful, that, that information. I mean, I, I can't really envision going straight into doing GPR and archeology span without having a fair amount of experience at different types of archeological sites. Um, Geoarchaeology is a really great focus to have. Uh, to understand uh, the GPR data. Um, uh, yeah, I think understanding stratigraphy, um, different types of soils and their properties. Um, and of course, then understanding the, the variation in archeological features, what a privy feature or you know, the, the pit underneath an outhouse looks like. Um, hundred years after it's been buried, you know, that's something that you know from excavation typically um, and translating that into assessment of, of a GPR profile feature mm -hmm. um, takes a fair amount of that experience. Mm -hmm. We have a question. Um, somebody wants to know about the most exciting discovery, discovery you've made with this technology. Hmm. Wow, there, it, it, there have been a lot of great ones, I think, but uh, one site that I found with GPR that I think is, is uh, pretty special, it's in the, um, we wrote it up in the uh, Archaeological Research uh, Facility series um, in the book, uh, Triangulating Archaeological Landscapes. Um, Camp Castaway is the name of the site. It's on the Oregon coast, actually in the dunes not in this setting, but in a real wide open dune area. And it was a camp that uh, was formed in 1852 when uh, soldiers from Venetia down here were on their way to Port Orford in Oregon and they got caught in a storm and their ship wrecked on the beach in Oregon. And they formed a military camp for four months and they traded with the Coos tribe locally and were able to sustain themselves through those months until the end of winter and they salvaged the cargo of the ship and then finally were able to take it down to Port Orford, which was about 50 miles to the south. And I was able to use GPR to relocate that camp, which people had thought had, I mean, had been washed to sea 100 years ago. It hadn't been seen in over 100, almost 150 years. Mm -hmm. um, but the radar showed me uh, buried iron rods and things. And of course, in that case, I used um, uh, uh, archival maps, historic maps were really key in, in going back and relocating that. Luckily, the, co the US Coast Survey had done some fantastic mapping of that coastline, just mm -hmm. like they have around San Francisco Bay um, back in the 1850s. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, that sounds like an exciting find. Um, and I guess you didn't run into the problem of salt water there because you were high enough on the dunes. That's right. Although I did do some transects down towards the beach, uh, looking for the actual shipwreck itself. Often the ships have ballast in them that we might be able to identify, but if that's in the intertidal zone, then I'm probably not going to see it uh, because of the salt water. And I didn't see any evidence of the ship itself. Uh, most of the ship was taken apart, though, uh, to use for building that camp. Mm -hmm. All right, well, that's about all the time we have. So I wanted to thank you, Scott, for joining us on Ask an Archaeologist. Um, and I want to thank the listeners and the viewers who sent in questions. Uh, and I'd like to invite listeners to our next Ask an Archaeologist. I'll be speaking with Professor Kim Shelton from the Classics Department this afternoon at 2 p.m. She's presenting on the topic of digging up, ancient digging up the heroes of ancient Greece. So please join us at 2 p.m. Thanks again, Scott. It was great talking with you. Thanks. Go Bears. Hmm.